So, um, as everyone in the room knows, uh, for anyone who may be watching that doesn't, I am uh, Pastor Mark Lambert here at Pastor Liberty Hill Baptist Church. Um, and I, I love doing events. I love doing things where we get to uh, question, we get to push, where we get to learn, we get to stretch what we know about God and about the Bible and about Christianity and all that sort of thing. It is one of the biggest things that is on my mind, on my heart in ministry is uh, addressing people's questions, addressing people's doubts. Addressing why people might actually want to walk away from the greatest love and mercy and grace the world has ever known, but for some reason, they do. And so, what I want to talk about in my talk, because um, I have a weird obsession with naming things, my talk is called The Truth Turned Inside Out. And so, we're going to take a look at how it is that people often try to... Um, determine things that are true, but they do it in backwards, twisted around ways. First off, and it's strange that I should even ask this, but um, do we all agree that we should want to believe true things? Right? That the things we believe should be the stuff that's true. It's actually really common for um, uh, skeptics. I've, I've heard uh, say, you know, I want to believe as many true things as possible and not believe as many false things. As possible, right? Because we, we should believe the truth. Our life should line up with the way the world actually is. And it shouldn't be a strange thing for me to have to say that, but it seems like there's so much that people go about living their lives and things they say and things they do that don't actually seem to line up with the way the world is. So how do we determine how the world is? How do we determine what it is that we should believe? How we conclude what is true? Well, in order to know how to find an answer to a question about what is true, what actually lines up with reality, you first have to know uh, something about the nature of the things you're asking about, right? I mean, it helps that you understand what you're searching for in order to get there. Um, how many have actually seen one of the movies of The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy? Anybody actually read the books? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I haven't read the book, seen the movies. And in there, it, 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 it's such a funny thing, and it's the reason why it is so humorous is the absurdity, right? They, they want to know the answer to the ultimate question about life, the universe, and everything, right? So they build a computer that is going to be able to calculate the answer to the ultimate question of life, the universe, and everything. And they get the answer. Finally, the day comes. What is the answer? And the computer says the answer is 42. 42? Well, then what's the question? Oh, well, I wasn't programmed to give you the question, just the answer. And that's humorous because it's absurd. How do you have an answer? We don't even know the question. You have to ask the right questions in order to get an answer. So depending on what you're looking for, I'm going to say that questions basically fall into two broad categories, right? There's things that are inside things about you that are unique to you, about your person, um, about your perspective, about your insight, your desires, right? But then there's questions about the outside world, outside questions, things about um, things that have nothing to do with you and how you feel and how you think and what you perceive. So like inside questions, for instance, uh, do I love my wife? Okay, there's nothing outside, out there, that's going to give you the answer or give me the answer of, do I love my wife? That, that, that's found inside. That's an inside question. Right? Um, why do I get so frustrated with my kids? They're just being kids. Right? That's an inside question. What, why have I actually watched all 10 seasons of The Walking Dead whenever that show just went in the gutter after season three. And I already know that the producers have said there are no happy endings. It's just going to be bad news after bad news after bad news. But I watched it anyway. Why? That's an inside question. But there's outside questions, questions about things that have to do not with what's inside you, but about the reality of the world around you, that it doesn't matter. You could not even exist. And it's not going to change the answer to the question. Is this podium made of wood? 
There, there is absolutely nothing about my feelings on the matter that are going to determine whether or not this is wood. It either is or it is not. Right? We, we have um, work done on the air conditioners. Why do we need to have work done on the air conditioners? Well, see, that, that's actually a question that's outside of me. You actually got to go into reality to the air conditioner to figure out what's wrong with it to know why we need to have work done. There's nothing inside me that's going to answer that question. It's an outside question. But we live in a culture where people actually think that inside questions can give them the answers to outside issues. Where what they feel is going to tell them something about objective reality, where an experience they have is what determines what is true. Or maybe even that relationships that they have is what they base their beliefs on. Rather than asking the questions about reality in the outside world, they turn inwards to find answers to outside questions. Let me give you a few examples. So one of the big ones is feelings. Right, they, pe people like you know, it's like what they feel is like what the world is really supposed to be. Of course, we know this not to be true. One of the best examples, right? Those of you who have kids, whenever your kid says, I, "I'm scared," right? My, my, mine are kind of past the age of where they get this, but not too long ago they were, where um, you know, like, like Annabelle comes running in the room, she's scared of the monster in her room. Of course, is there a monster in her room? No, you flip on the light and it's a pile of toys, which she was supposed to put up. And the light shining in through the, you know, the moonlight through the window, casting a shadow and it looks creepy. And so she's scared. Now, the answer to whether or not she has a reason to fear, that's an outside question. Is there really a monster there? No, you flip on the light, it's your toy you left out. That's feelings. There's a few things that, um, let me venture into treacherous waters, right? So some uh, uh, current event issues. So I was watching a uh, man on the street kind of interview where they go out and they're asking people questions about things. And they were asking people, what do you think is your chance of being hospitalized if you get COVID? And the overwhelming majority of people answered things like over 50%, that if you get COVID, you're going to the hospital. Well, the real answer is in the single digits, like 1% or 2%, if not less. But why do people think that, okay, if I contract this, then I am going to the hospital? Well, because the feelings have been stirred up, whether through news or friends or whatever, and so that's what's in their mind, and that's that they're making their decision based on feelings. One thing that has been really big in the news over the last uh, couple years is uh, the police shootings of unarmed black men. Again, I see a survey where they ask people, how many unarmed black men are shot by police every year? And the majority of people answer in the hundreds or thousands some say even tens of thousands, per year, whereas the real answer is less than 20. It fluctuates, but it's about a dozen. Now, regardless of what you think about race issues in our culture, what you might think about policing, why do people think that whenever something is about 10, they're saying it's a 1,000? Because their feelings have been stirred up, and they're basing their perception of reality on how they feel. <clears throat> Another thing people have is that they, they're, they will experience something, and based on that experience, they will draw a conclusion, and they will then say, that is the way the world is. But is it possible for you to experience something and draw a false conclusion from that? Right? Anybody marry the very first person they fell in love with? I almost got engaged once, but not really. My experience of the young woman, everything that I had experienced in that relationship told me we were going to be together. And I was getting the ring. I even had her friends plotting with me. 
to orchestrate the perfect moment to pop the question. Now, obviously, that didn't happen because I didn't marry her. I married Molly. But there was not, I mean, everything in my experience said she wants to be my wife. My experience misled me. Now, we're in church, so if we're going to talk about experience, how about we talk about religious experience? Right, because that's one thing that we, I mean, Christians will say, I, I felt the presence of God. I had that experience. Okay, maybe you did. Maybe you didn't. Thursday night youth camp, you're all exhausted, haven't hardly slept all week, and it's an emotional moment and everybody's crying. Were you caught up in the moment or did you really experience God? Maybe you did. Maybe you didn't. Mormons, if you talk to Mormons and you say, hey, how am I supposed to know if this is true? But will they tell you, pray to God and he will give you a burning in the bosom a religious experience that it will tell you and confirm to you that it is true. When you talk to Mormons, they've had that experience. D does that mean it's true? You, you talk to people from Eastern uh, religions, they've had spiritual experiences. Does that mean their religion is true? I mean, surely we're, most of us Christians here, we're going to say no. No, no, Jesus is what's true. How about lack of experience? Right? I know people that say, I sat in church Sunday after Sunday, week after week, and people talking about the Holy Spirit moving, and I never felt anything. Well, okay, does that mean Christianity is false? Because they didn't have an experience? fact is that having a spiritual experience does not prove something true. Having an experience, not having experience doesn't prove something false. The truth lies outside. The experience, it can be added to the pile of evidence for or against, but it alone cannot give you the truth of reality. Another thing that will often uh, drive people to make conclusions about the world is relationships. I don't know how many stories, it seems like they pop up every now and then, where you have some high-profile Christian who had been banging the pulpit about, you know, such and such is a sin. And then they meet someone or they have a close friend or relative who commits that behavior, lives that lifestyle. And they go, oh, well, maybe I was wrong about it, you know. Because he, he, here's my brother, here's my sister, here's my friend, here's my coworker, and they're such a decent person they're such a kind and wonderful person. I can't believe God would want to say they're wrong because they have such a great relationship, you see. You ever seen Ocean's Eleven? Right? Those guys are hilarious. That is a funny movie. They're likable characters. Oh, those rascals are up to no good. Okay, but they're stealing millions of dollars. Yeah, but the guy they're stealing from, he's a bad guy. No, okay, let's stop. Hold on a second. Because some characters, because some people are likable, does that mean what they're doing is okay? But yet people draw these conclusions. Well, I know the Bible says homosexuality is a sin, but I know a gay person, and they're a wonderful person. Well, okay, just because you have a good relationship with someone doesn't mean what they're doing is Okay. One of my favorite verses um, having to do with this kind of issue, Proverbs 6, 30 and 31, says, People do not despise a thief if he steals to satisfy himself when he is starving. Yet when he is found, he must restore sevenfold. He may have to give up all the substance of his house. So I've got a neighbor. His name's Jay. I like Jay. Jay is a great guy. Real good. He, he is the kind of neighbor you want. He's the kind of neighbor who's going to notice if something's going on around your house, if there's someone suspicious in the neighborhood. He's the one that's going to loan you something. He, great guy. Wonderful man. Now, let's say, for instance, um, he, he, he's a mechanic, so a lot of his income is just on whether or not he's getting work. Let's say that he hits a dry spell. He doesn't have work. He's down on his luck. Times are hard. And so he goes to the neighbor down the street who has a whole bunch, and he takes something from him. Now, I love Jay. I don't actually think he would steal, but for this example, let's say he does. 
well, because Jay is such a great guy and such a good neighbor, does that make it okay that he stole? No. See, but we want to pick out certain issues in the culture and say, okay, someone living that lifestyle, someone committing that behavior, but otherwise they're such a great person and they're just so decent and good and they're a great friend, so I can't think bad of them. No, that doesn't affect the truth of the matter of what is right or what is wrong. Your personal feelings or relationships do not change what is or is not true. By the way, neither does someone being a bad person. How many people have a story or know someone who has a story of being treated horrible in church by leadership? Right? Those, those, those stories abound. And there's people who go, I walked away from there because a man of God shouldn't act that way. No, he shouldn't. But does that make Christianity false? Be it how many people, because of a bad relationship with someone who named the name of Christ, decided they're going to reject Christ because of that relationship with that person. They weren't determining the truth of a matter based on an outside question about reality. They were based on something inside. So I hope you see that often what is true is a matter of questions that can only be answered outside of ourselves. Regardless of how we feel, regardless of what we experience. Outside questions, the truth of which have nothing to do with what's going on inside. So three big issues that, that, that I would say, that there's some others we can talk about that are core, but I think three main issues that Christianity kind of hinge on. Does God exist? I mean, right, if there's no God, there's no Christianity. So God's got to exist, or this whole thing's, you know, makes no sense. Okay, but is that an inside question, or is that an outside question? Well, if it's an outside question, what are the answers? Now, I've given talks on those before. We've talked about that a whole bunch before. Actually, right now, um, we're, we're dropping some videos on our YouTube channel uh, that are some old videos from some years ago uh, that I've updated and reposting on the YouTube channel that have to do with, does God exist? And kind of three big issues that you look at the evidence, you go, yes, he has to exist. It's the beginning of the universe. Everything had a beginning. I'm not going to go into the details of why everything had to have a beginning, but, you know, popular science seems to say, hey, you know, you wind the clock back, there was a beginning. There's the fact that philosophically, an eternal past regress is impossible. There had to have been a beginning of time. And so if the universe had a beginning by which we mean time, space, and matter, that means whatever made the universe begin had to be timeless, spaceless, and material. It also had to be personal so that it could actually make the choice and willfully cause the universe to exist. It had to have the intelligence in order to be able to do so and design the universe and cause the universe to exist. And it had to be powerful enough, you could say all-powerful, to make the universe exist? Well, gee, let's see. Timeless, spaceless, immaterial, person, intelligent, all-powerful. Sounds a lot like God to me. We look at the design and the order of the universe. Everything from the, the, the laws of nature that drive creation all the way down into the microscopic building blocks of our cells. There's design and order everywhere you look. Well, a design had to have a designer. You look at morality. We know for a fact there is such a thing as objective right and wrong. The idea of a subjective relative morality is an oxymoron. If it's not a universal standard, you're not talking about morality. You're just talking about your opinions. But we know there really are some things that are evil. And if there's evil, how would you know what's evil unless there was a standard of good? And if there's a standard of good, well, a moral law needs a moral lawgiver. See, those are questions outside of you. Second thing, is the Bible reliable? I mean, because it either is or it isn't. doesn't really matter how you feel or what you experience. Those documents either are reliable and true or they're not. There's all kinds of reasons and explanations we can give as to why they are, that they are eyewitness testimony that was written down within living memory of the events that they record that we have such an abundance of material that we can check and double check and figure out any errors or anything, and we know who wrote them. We know that these are reliable accounts. And third, did Jesus raise from the dead? 
Because if Jesus rose from the dead, he's pretty much confirming everything he claimed about himself. And we know that Jesus did in fact live. There's some people that are called uh, Jesus mythicists who say, well, Jesus never actually existed yet. Those are the flat earthers of the skeptical community. And I mean that seriously. People who say that the person, Jesus of Nazareth, ne never existed are on par with flat earthers. That's how deranged they are in their thinking. There is not a serious scholar in the world that is going to tell you Jesus didn't exist. Because the facts are there, he did. And the facts are there historically. We know that he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. Historically, we know that he was put into a tomb. We know that that tomb was found empty by some of his women followers. And we know that both uh, followers and skeptics alike sincerely report that they encountered the risen Jesus. He was alive, he was dead, he was buried, it's empty, he was seen alive again. That's called a resurrection. That either happened or it did not. And what you feel doesn't affect that one bit. Inside issues do not change outside reality. And two of the biggest issues that I see people bring up when it comes to objections against Christianity and reasons they want to argue why they don't believe Christianity is the problem of evil and divine hiddenness. But when you get down to the reality of it, those are inside questions. Because logically, evil does not mean that God can't exist. A good, loving God can exist. He can have perfectly reasonable, moral reasons to allow evil. That's a different talk. But logically, there is no contradiction there. Philosophers know this. So what they turn to is, well, it just doesn't seem to me that it would make sense because I see these evil things happen, I see this suffering going on, and I don't think a loving God is going to do that. Okay, well, it's not about what you feel. It's about what's true because regardless of what, how you may feel or what you may personally think about a particular instance of evil or suffering, the reasons for God's existence doesn't hinge on your feelings. The idea of divine hiddenness. Well, I've never experienced God. I've never seen God. I've never, okay, but that's your experience. That these other reasons for believing that God exists, they don't change based on your experience, whether you have one or don't. They're true or they're not true. It's an outside question, not an inside. Our feelings serve a purpose. God gave them to us. They're good things. But they're not the only thing and they're not the main thing. And they can't answer questions about an outside reality that is true or false that has nothing to do with how we feel about it. Our experiences, they serve a purpose. It's one of the ways that we gather knowledge about things, but it alone cannot give us answers. Relationships are great things. We are social creatures. We are made in the image of God, and God at his core is Social, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, eternal, loving, communion, relationship. Relationships are great. But a relationship alone doesn't give you the answer to questions. The answers that exist, no matter how you feel about them or what relationships you experience. The outside truth is that Christianity makes the most sense of the world the way it really is regardless of how we feel about it. God really does exist. The Bible really is reliable. We really are sinners deserving of judgment from a sovereign creator against whom we have rebelled. And God really did demonstrate his love for us and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Paying the price for our sin. And then he really did raise on the third day to a new life that we also share in. And so we repent of our sin. We put our trust in Christ because as we examine the outside questions about reality, we see that it's true. And however we might feel about a certain thing, whatever experience we might have, whatever relationship we might have, that's not something that is going to determine what actually is or is not the fact of the matter. The fact of the matter is, 
The reality exists regardless of how we feel or what we experience on the inside. But our culture wants to say, no, no, no. It's how you feel. It's based on your experience that truth is found within you. But when we're asking questions about things that are true, whether you exist or not, the answer cannot be found in you. It must be found outside. And whenever we look outside, we see a God that created us and loved us and gave himself that we might be saved. That little church on Liberty Hill, come praise the Lord, let your cup be filled. Raise your voices and we'll sing. Let God's freedom ring from that little church on Liberty.